In this video, we're going to be discussing the anatomy and physiology of an often neglected muscle shown over here in the image in green, and that is the platysma muscle. So we'll be talking about its origin, insertions, actions, etc. So what's the origin of the platysma muscle? The origin is actually the inferior part of the muscle, down here inferior to the clavicles. So the platysma originates from the skin and fascia of the infraclavicular and supraclavicular regions. And technically, the muscle arises from the fascia that covers the upper segments of the deltoid and the pectoralis muscles. So if we look here in this image, right here we see the right platysma muscle. This is the most superficial muscle in the anterior neck, even more superficial than the SCM over here, the sternocleidomastoid. If you look inferiorly below the right clavicle right here, you can actually see the portion of the platysma muscle that actually arises from the pectoral fascia here, and then more laterally, the deltoid fascia. Now, obviously, on the left side of this image, they've removed the platysma so we can see the underlying muscles. And we often think of the sternocleidomastoid being the most superficial, but no the platysma is even more superficial. So when you palpate the sternocleidomastoid, you're actually going through the platysma to reach the SCM. And also, interesting note, if you just put your finger on your own clavicle, it feels like there's nothing there. It just feels like maybe some skin and, of course, subcutaneous tissue. But the platysma actually goes over the clavicle. So when you touch your clavicle, you're actually going through the platysma. You barely even feel it, if at all. And that should give you an indication how thin this muscle is. It is a very thin, broad, sheet-like muscle. But the platysma is the most superficial muscle of the anterior neck. Now let's talk about the insertions of the platysma, which attach to the muscle more superiorly up here. So the first one is the lower border of the mandible, which you can see here in the image. This allows the platysma to assist with mandibular depression, but understand that it is not the prime mover of mandibular depression. We'll talk about that more in just a minute. It also inserts on the skin of the cheek region and lower lip, and it also inserts on the modiolus. If you're not familiar with that term, the modiolus refers to this point at the corners or angles of the mouth where you have a junction or intersection between multiple facial muscles. For example, the zygomaticus muscle right here, the rosorius here, and the orbicularis oris surrounding the mouth. And what we actually see is that the platysma directly fuses with the orbicularis oris. But again, it has a direct insertion on the modiolus. Now for the actions of the platysma muscle. Other than producing facial expressions like this one shown in the image here, the exact functions of this muscle are still subject to debate. However, I tend to think that sometimes the simplest answer is the best. The platysma facilitates these types of facial expressions. And you might see this during times of disgust or surprise, etc. And the way that the platysma facilitates this facial expression is by tensing the skin of the lower face and the anterior neck. Now, we already mentioned that by virtue that it inserts on the lower border of the mandible, it's able to assist with mandibular depression. But remember, mandibular depression from our TMJ playlist is actually mainly facilitated just by gravity. But the major muscle, if you had to call one the prime mover, is actually the lateral pterygoids. But the platysma can assist with that. The platysma also is going to depress the angle of the mouth and the lip, but again, it's not the prime mover of this. The prime movers of lip depression and depressing the angle of the mouth are the depressor anguli oris and the depressor labii inferiori. And then here's a function that's not normally talked about. The platysma will prevent the compression of the jugular veins during intense respiratory effort, in general during intense exercise. So if you actually look at people who are heavily exerting themselves and they're breathing really hard, you actually see a little bit of flaring of the platysma out, so contraction of this muscle. And what this is thought to do is prevent compression of the jugular veins. Remember, the jugular veins are very superficial. And so during intense effort, all the contraction of muscles in the neck and the upper thorax could potentially compress those jugular veins. And so the platysma flaring out is thought to open up the anterior neck 
and relieve some of that potential compression. Now, the innervation of the platysma is by cranial nerve 7. This is the facial nerve, but it's specifically through the cervical branch of the facial nerve. And its blood supply is numerous, partly from the submental artery, which is a branch of the facial artery, partly from the suprascapular artery, a branch of the thyrocervical trunk, and then also has contributions from the subcostal and lowest five intercostal arteries, and also the inferior and superior phrenic arteries. So hopefully this video gave you a good understanding of the relevant anatomy and physiology of the platysma muscle. In the next video, we're going to go over how to strengthen the platysma and why you might want to do that. So make sure to join us in the next video. Thank you for all your support. Be sure to check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff.